Today I want to turn to a part of scripture. And I'm looking at Matthew right now, chapter 4. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, the word of God tells us that Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases among the people. And then the word of God says, the next verse then, his fame went throughout all Syria. And it brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, <coughs> epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. May the Lord just bless the reading of his word here. <coughs> Very important key we hear. We hear this name of Jesus. Now, some of us say, yes, yes, I know all about Jesus. We know that he walked upon this earth at one point of time. History recorded that there was this man called Jesus. History also recorded that this man, Jesus, died at the cross. And sometimes we wonder, what is the importance? Why did he come? Why did he have to die? I know some of you may say, all of us, we are born on this earth. We lived a life, but we all know that we lived a season only in this earth. The life in this earth is not forever and forever. And there's a season where a man is born. There's a season where man lives different parts of the life. And there's a season where the Word of God reminds, reminds us there are counts for men to die. And all of us will face the spectre of death. But the big question is, as we look at the life of Jesus, who is this man? Who is this man that should come? <coughs> who is this man that came at a season and a time? A man that lived an ordinary life. A man that for 30 years of his life did no miracles, nothing. But a man that was so anointed by God suddenly that for three years, miracles walked with him. And after the end of three years, tragic though it may be, but it was necessary at the age of 33 years old. We know the word of God tells us he was led to the cross. It was not the wish of people. In fact, he reminded the Roman governor at that time that if God did not permit it, you have no power over me. So the word of God reminds us how Jesus of Nazareth, who came, who was anointed by God, key word for us to understand, anointed by God. Acts 10, 38, how Jesus of Nazareth, an ordinary man, it may seem, was anointed by the Spirit of God. And he went around doing good and healing all. Now, sometimes you may ask, why did this have to happen? Well, who is this Jesus? You know, I struggled with this for a long time because I myself grew up in a Christian family. I was brought up to understand this story about Jesus, about God's love and everything else. But you know, I never fully understood we can believe and often yet not understand what we believe. We can be sitting in church hearing and hearing and hearing, and I like what my dear brother, Reverend Timothy, preached here. He said, you know, there's a good Chinese saying, when you hear, you will forget. It's only when you see that you remember. But it's only when you are doing it then you will understand. And I tell you this, I sat in church 40 over years of my life and I've heard and I've heard and I've heard. Yes. But what did I see? I saw nothing but Christianity as a religion. And it was much later at 40 years old when I had that encounter with God that I begin to realize that Christianity is not a religion. 
Christianity is about a God that may see, seem so far away, a God that you may not see. But yet a God that so loves and a God that wants you and I to be in that relationship with Him. A God that is a consistent God. A God that does not change. A God that knows from the beginning to the end, and He calls Himself the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. And a lot of us can know God as, yes, we believe there's a God in the beginning. That there is a God who created. We can believe that, yes, there's an end that we will meet this God. But I want you to hear something. It took me a long time to realize that He was also God between the beginning and the end. That He is the God between the beginning and the end. Sometimes in this life, we tend to live life the way we want to live it. We have our dreams, we have the ambitions. And in our dreams and ambitions, we set objectives in our lives. Now I want you to hear something. That God has a plan, the Word of God says. And they are plans of good and not evil plans to give hope in the future. But many of us live in this life between the beginning and the end in hopelessness, in times of helplessness. I had somebody who even wrote to me and he said, you know, I am at this point of time, right at the end, I don't want to believe if all. I have no hope, no nothing in life. I'm in financial problem. I'm in this, I'm in that. And this life seems to be nothing but suffering. I want to tell you this. This is what good intentions, our own ambitions bring us. History recorded there was a man called Gautama Buddha. He lived on this life. And what did he see? He lived a protected life in a palace as a prince. But one day he had a chance to go out. And what did he see? He saw nothing but suffering. And he came to a conclusion, this life is nothing about suffering. And that this life is not a life that we should want to live in. But I say this to everybody. If you really believe this life is all suffering and there's nothing to live in this life, then why get born and why live in this life at all? Well, I'll tell you something. When I've gone to hospital to pray for people, some people may be so sick. And I look at them, I see them so bad. I say, Maybe I should pray for them that you should go up there in the street by and by. But I won't tell you this. I never had one man say, okay, pray for me to die. They will always say, pray for me to live. Pray for me that I get healed. I wonder, is life all suffering? Well, let's look at what the Word of God tells us. That life can be all suffering if we do not understand something. The reason why this had to happen that this man called Jesus Christ had to come. If you look at the gospel in John chapter 1, in verse 1, the Word of God tells us, in the beginning. Key word, in the beginning. And if you look at the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it also starts the word, in the beginning. God created. So we must understand that there is a God in the beginning. Every one of us has a beginning. Except this God. There's no explanation. It says, in the beginning, God created. Didn't tell us where this God come from. What, who is this God? What is this God? But yet, in the word of John, he said, in the beginning, he didn't say, was God, was the word. And the word was with God. So we hear this word coming in. What is this word? You know, when I first read scripture, and I was brought up 40 years l reading the Bible. Yes, I was taught the Bible from very young. I grew up through a Methodist Sunday school. I was a Bible teacher. I was a Sunday school teacher. I was in a choir, lived a very, very holy life, so to speak. But I didn't quite understand things. Here it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And sometimes we can limit our understanding when you look at the word, word, 
as nothing but the Bible and written scripture. Yes, I want you to hear this. The Bible and this word of scripture is part of the word. But it's not the word in totality. It took me a long time to understand this. Because in our limited human understanding, we see words as letters. We see words as something that's communicated us in writing. But it was at the age of 40 years old that I encountered that this word is not just about a dead letter in a book. I begin to encounter that the word, word, was more than that. When I studied the Bible, I re realized that the word itself is about God wanting to reveal himself in totality to man. And God, as he created, was trying to reveal himself in creation. And that's why this Bible says, almost talking about the word, not as a letter, but like a life there. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Very confusing. You mean this dead letter, this Bible, had life that could create? Yes. Even as a total revelation of God, as God was creating, what was he creating? He was not creating, going around, taking earth and trying to fashion like we all as human beings would create when we make things. We make things with our hands, but something was there, if you read the Bible. In the beginning, God created. And God created through what? By calling the things which be not as though they were. What did God say? By calling the things which be not as though they were. So what did God do? He had intent for something. And all he had to do was to speak. You see, word is a dead letter until you put a voice to the word. A voice can be just be a sound. I say, hoi! That's a sound. That's my voice. But there is no communication in that until it comes a meaning. And the meaning of God was his intent as he spoke it. When God was able to say, let there be light, and the Bible says there was light. Let there be, and let there be, and let there be, and the whole of creation came into being because God spoke a word. The word that's a dead letter, a word that wants to reveal us, God, can only have life when the voice of God speaks into it. And so we understand this. The voice of God was what walked with Adam when he was in the garden. Yes, the Bible says the voice of God walked with Adam. Because words are dead letter until there is voice given behind it that brings it into communication. And God is not only just trying to communicate to us. I want you to hear this. That's why I learned only at 40 years old that Christianity is not a religion. It's not about practices. It's not about going to church. Hey, all this is good. Don't get me wrong. But Christianity is about a personal relationship that you and I need to develop with the living God. Because that very living God wants to develop that relationship with you and I. So the Word of God reminds us that God not only revealed Himself as He created, but God began to speak to individuals. He began to speak to people we call the fathers of the Bible. He began to speak to Adam. He began to speak to Noah. He began to walk and talk with Enoch, the Bible says. And God began to speak and to have a relationship. So the word became from just the power of God that we see in creation to become a form of communication. And even as God spoke, the word became, we read the Bible, a prophetic word. A word where God was not only just trying to reveal himself, but to reveal his intention for future and things to come. And this Bible is very interesting. Do you know that 
Over 30% of this Bible contains writings of things to come. This Bible also contains history, contains poetry, but it also contains revelation of even science. Before man knew the scientific facts, God already wrote about it in the Bible. Yes, it took a long time for men to understand. Before Isaac Newton, it was, right, who discovered gravity, the Bible makes a statement, the earth hangs on nothing. Do you know in physics today, that's one of the first statements of gravity. Before man could discover that the stars are countless. Today, as we have modern telescopes, the more we see, the more we realize the stars are, counted, are countless. Yet God said, the stars are countless to Abraham. Yeah. I want to tell you something. At the time of Christopher Columbus, has Jesus come, died? Was Columbus a Christian? Yes. Yet at this time, people believed that the world was flat. And if you sail too much out from land, you will fall off the face of the earth. And so even sailors did not dare sail out. They were hard in the land, so to speak. But yet, Columbus had a revelation when the Spirit of God came to him. Because all of a sudden, it's written in the Bible, before even man knew that the world was round, the Bible says, and the Spirit of God sits upon the circle of the earth. And his revelation get to how can God's Spirit sit upon a circle of the earth unless the earth is round? People, I want to tell you, there's so much revelation of God. Revelation of God that He knows. He is the beginning, He's the end. He's everything else in between. Well, it took me a long time to understand this. Then the question come, came to me. Why then am I trying to live this life? Trying to work things out. I had my own plans. I had my own ambition. I had my own desires. In 1998 was when I learned that all my hopes and desires meant nothing if God was not with me. In 1998, I really got saved in 1990 again. But it came to a point of absolute surrender when I was able to say, like the Apostle Paul said, in Him alone, in Him alone, I can live, I can move, I have my being. And because of that, I can do all things in Christ that strengthened me. I won't tell you why. Because not only did God begin to communicate as He spoke, not only God began to tell us the future as he spoke the prophetic word, but God had his word written so that we don't make mistakes when you read the word. This Bible, 66 books, collected over, by, written by some 40 different men, collected over 2,000 years. I want to tell you this. If you read the Bible and you understand under this revelation given the Spirit of God, there's only one author to this. Is God Himself the Holy Spirit of God. From the beginning, 2,000 years, God has been consistent in His revelation of Himself. God is the same even as He dealt with people like Israel. God reminds us, these things that happen to Israel is not to entertain you. In the book of Corinthians, He said, now all these things happen to Israel, the history, as examples, as no, not just examples, as a typology, as samples for us to understand how God wants us to relate in life to Him. I won't tell you this. Until that day of understanding came, until that day, not only did I able to believe, Jeremiah 29, 11, the prophet said, for I know the plans I have you, says God. And the plans of good and not evil plans to give you hope in the future. It was on that day when I had this final revelation. It's not about my plans. I must, and this is the problem, because many of us want to initiate our own plans, and we want to institute our own plans, and then we look to God and say, God, now you align to my plans, you bless my plans. It was in 1990 I realized it's not about my plans, it's about His plans. 
that he's the one that initiates, then he's the one that positions us in the plan, if we allow him to. And when it's not about him aligning us, aligning to our plans, it's us learning how to align ourselves to his plans. In his plans, I want you to hear this. And his plans are meant for good. Sometimes we do not like his plans because we have our own ambitions. Sometimes we have our own trust. The Bible tells us there was a man. And Jesus tells this story. This man said, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to work very hard. I'm going to build barns. I'm going to work very hard. And I'm going to fill up the barns. And I, when I have all this, I'm going to be able to relax, enjoy myself, because, hey, my future is secured. You know what Jesus said? You're a fool. Because your future is in God's hands. And he said to the man, you're a fool because tonight you will die. Then what is all your ambitions and what you have laid up? Can you bring it with you? I've yet to go to a funeral and see a man bring all his worldly treasures with him. When a man dies, I want to tell you this. Sad though it may be. Now, I'm not trying to make a mockery. But you know, the treasure he accumulates on earth, he can only leave as an inheritance to the next generation. And sometimes we are so foolish. There's a Chinese saying, the first generation make the money. Second generation enjoy the money. Third gen generation, no more money. <laughs> That's the reality. The Bible, however, tells us different promises. He says if you align yourself to God's plan, not that God doesn't want to deprive, uh, deprive you of anything. Once you have aligned to God's plan, in fact, God says what? When I read this, it changed my whole understanding. Who is the word, the Bible says? In the word was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and even darkness cannot overcome the light. Who is this man? The Bible says he's the true light, which gives light to every man coming to the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world yet did not know him. In fact, the world rejected him. And that's why. But, here comes verse 12. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. You see, God is trying to tell us something. If you understand why Jesus came, if you would believe in him, if you would receive your life, you become a child of the living God. You know why? This man is, the Bible says, the word that became flesh. The word of God, the very revelation of God. From the revelation of God as God created. From the revelation of God as God spoke to the Father's own. From the revelation of God as God gave the prophetic understanding through the prophets. Through the revelation of God as from the time of Moses that the word of God became recorded. To a time of Jesus, when the word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us for a purpose that we can behold his glory. Whose glory? Actually, the glory of God. Because he was the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we need to understand that he is the one. Through him, we can then understand our new hope, new future, as being a child of the living God. Tomorrow, in a lot of churches, we are celebrating Father's Day. I want to tell you something. I've learned one thing. Who your father is, is what determines the inheritance you received. When God becomes your heavenly father, 
I won't tell you this. I didn't understand it. it. Took Paul, the apostle, some time to understand it. Before he finally wrote in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, he said, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. I want you to hear this word, who has blessed us. In fact, the correct translation is, who has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings. The word all spiritual blessings means whatever you need. Whatever you need in this life, in this life. If you need healing, He has got healing for you. If you need reconciliation, Jesus came to bring that ministry of reconciliation, the Bible says. If you need restoration, He is your restorer. If you need provision, He is the provider. I want to tell you, it took me a long time to work this out. That this Bible is not a rule book to make our life difficult. Some people say, oh, yeah. This Bible contains a lot of do, 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 and do not, do not, do not. But I want to tell you this. It took me a long time to understand that this Bible contains 7,487 covenant promises from a loving God to His creation. And Paul says, Blessed be God the Father, who hath already blessed us with all this spiritual blessing in Christ. All. Everything you need when Jesus Christ came, He has restored it. The world was separate from God through the mistakes that Adam made. But through Jesus Christ, the first Adam, through disobedience, brought separation. But through the obedience of one man, Jesus Christ, who was obedient even to follow the will of God right up to the cross. Yes, he was a man who suffered, who struggled. The Bible says on the night even before the cross, he was in the garden wrestling, and he even said to God the Father, if you can, take away this cup from me. I don't want to go to the cross. But finally he said, I know, I have to. So let your will be done. Not my will, but yours be done. You see, a lot of times we still have our own plans, own purpose. And I want to tell you this. The Word of God reminds us this world is still a fallen world. In this world, you have sickness, you have disease. In this world, in fact, Jesus didn't say just sickness. He said, in this world, you have tribulation. The word tribulation is not just problem. Tribulation is big problems. And he said what? In me, you will have peace. I want you to hear this. He didn't say, in me, you have no problems. In me, you will have peace. Why? Because, he said, I have overcome the world. So what are you saying? In me, you will also overcome the world. In me, understand this. All these 7,487, Ephesians 1, 3 again, you're already blessed with all spiritual blessing in Christ. I won't tell you, once you are a believer, you are already entitled to all these 7,487 promises. You need healing. The world brings stress. The world brings all sorts of viruses and everything. I won't tell you this. You can't run away from it. Because the prophetic word of God says all these things are going to increase. Jesus even said, as we near the final end, pestilences. We are seeing it, SARS, MERS. <laughs> you know, things are going to be airborne very soon unless you don't breathe anymore. But I tell you this, in me, he says, in Christ. But again, the word didn't end there. He says, you have all this spiritual blessing in heaven. But I want you to hear this. We need the blessing right here. You need your healing right here. You need your restoration right here. You need your reconciliation right here. You need your provisions right here. You don't need it when you go 
up in a suite by and by to meet God? How do I bring those heavenly promises down to earthly reality? You're really entitled if you're a believer. You're really entitled, but the struggle is this. It's about where is your faith in? Hebrews chapter 11, 6 says, without faith you cannot please God. But listen, he that comes to God must know. He didn't say know who God is. There's too much information we know about God up here already. You got a Bible study and Bible study, you know all about God. But when you say they don't know who God is, know that God is what? That He is in your life. Have you come to a point like Paul, when Paul is able to say, yes, God, only in you alone can I live, can I move. Jesus, what you're asking me to do is to align myself to be more like you. To align myself that I can let go of anger, I can let go of unforgiveness. I can let go of all the things that want to bring me stress. I can let go and align myself. I want to tell you this. If you need finances, there are two ways you can get it. I used to labor. I used to do business. I used to plan. I used to scheme. I used to everything else. From 1998, I learned how to rest in God. Do you know it's not easy to rest in God? Yes, but once you learn to rest in God, you learn to cease, the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, you will, you will cease from your own works. And I want to tell you this, when you cease from your own works, God's abundance, God's providence, God's provision, when you need healing, when you need reconciliation, when you need restoration, when you need children, when you need anything, all things, Apostle, not by strength, not by might, but by His Spirit. I won't tell you, it took me a long time to realize. When I had a problem, my eyes going blind. I listened to doctors. Yes, nothing wrong with doctors, don't get me wrong. I was preparing for an self-operation when God convicted me that I had to cancel the operation. I had to learn to exercise faith. But faith is not blind. Faith comes from hearing, Romans 10, 17. But how can you hear if you're not spent time to build a relationship to hear from God? I want to hear this. It's not about coming to church here from me or from any pastor. Amen. There's a walk of faith that all of us got to walk. I can walk with you, but I cannot walk for you. Amen. And faith comes from hearing. I can walk with you because of my relationship with God. But I cannot walk for you because you need to build your own relationship with God. And I tell you this, to build a relationship, it's not about focusing on what you want. It's focusing on understand who God is. Amen. I was healed without operation. And I had a tag. Now, I'm not just saying recklessly. No, no. Even I had a heart attack. I was listening to doctors want to give me a triple bypass. But when God convicted me, then I said, God, I'm going to trust you. But it took me a long time to hear, a long time to what the Bible says, you've got to fight the good fight of faith. You can't lean on my faith. You yourself need to fight the good fight of faith. You want to fight the good fight of faith? First Timothy 6, 12 says, you lay hold of eternal life. Amen. You know what's eternal life? Jesus said eternal life is not about life after you die. Eternal life can be right now. In John 17, 3, and he says, this is eternal life, that you might know God. And the word know is not about head knowledge. The word know actually is a Hebrew word called yada. Yada means that you have come to a relationship with God that you have absolute trust, absolute confidence. God yadas you. He knows you. God wants you to yada him, to know him. 
And I want to tell you this. You cannot yada God coming with all your baggage. You cannot yada God coming with your own plans, your own ambitions. You cannot yada God by telling God, do it my way. It took me a long time to realize, God, it's not about my way. It's about your way. Amen. And I want to tell you this. I have lived this life now since 1998, struggling to yada God. I still have to fight the good fight of faith all the time. Every time I face a situation, I have. Even moving to this place. Do you know, for years, God has given us a word. Prophetic word. Even this place was described to us very clearly on August 20th, 2010. Five years before we entered. It took me a long time even to understand this, to align the church, even to understand what God wants. Different words was given for us. But when we under align, I tell you, it happened suddenly. In January, I had this word from God. I told my wife, we got to start getting ready and packed. We're going to move. You know what? I look at me and say, move where? We have no place yet. We don't know where yet. I said, don't. That's faith. Faith is when you heard, you begin to believe God and thank God. And it was in February that this place all of a sudden became offered to us. That's another story. It just happened suddenly. Everything came. God provided. As accordance with the prophetic word he gave to us almost five years earlier. God is not a man that he should lie. He is not... Yeah, not a man that he should repent. What the word of God says, has God not said it? Will he not do it? Has God not spoken? Will he not make it good? The answer is yes. But are you hearing from God? Or are you hearing from your own desires, your own ambitions, the things that you see around you? I want to tell you this. When I finally learned that in 1998, some of my friends said to me, Hey, brother, you look younger. I said, mm, I feel younger also. <laughs> because I've learned to rest. And I can declare to myself every morning, I'm too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> Do you know the world wants to bring stress upon you? When it brings stress upon you, what happens? Yeah, you have a lot of problems. Amen. I don't want to preach too much right now. There's only one way. And He is the way. It's not about your faith to know that He can do it. I have preached this last healing service. It's not faith that moves the mountains. It's our faith in a living God that moves the hand of God, that releases the power of God to move the mountains. Our faith is not grounded in what you want to see happen. Your faith must be grounded on who God is. Who is God to you? Who is Jesus Christ? John 17, 3. That you might know God as one true God and Jesus Christ whom He has sent. Is your faith willing to touch Him to move the mountains? I want to tell you this. He's got enough power as he created the world, enough power to change the world, enough power to save this world. But in his wisdom, he wants you to be children of his. In his wisdom, he wants you to work alongside him. In his wisdom, he wants you to know him as that one true God. Let's quite know hearts right now. I don't have your answer. I'm not your answer. He is. It took me a long time, I share with you, also to be like Paul, to know that only in him alone can I live, can I move, and can I have my being. I share this with you, but you also need to struggle to walk that faith. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God knows the plans he has for you. 
but then there are plans of good and not evil. Plans to give you hope and a future. God's plans always bring you hope and a future. It does not bring you to hopelessness. It does not bring you to helplessness. It does not bring you into depression and discouragement. God says, first, you have to settle this. If you really agree that His plans are good, the next verse says, then and only then, you will begin to pray to Him. Interesting, God says, when you pray to me, He didn't say, I answer you. He said, I will be hearing. I hear you. Then He said, you begin to seek me. Jeremiah 29, 12. You begin to seek me. Because obviously you pray and you don't get your answer. And then in verse 13 says, and you shall surely find me. When you have God, you have all that you need. And he said, and you shall surely find me when you seek for me. <laughs> he didn't say seek for what you need. You seek God with all your heart. Hallelujah.